presentation of the Lillian Smith Book Awards, I stand before you as one who, like many of you, can remember a time when a gathering such as this, uh, where people of many races come together in the same social space, was highly improbable. Our region labored under a brutal system of racial apartheid in which, which carried with it its own sense of permanence and, and inevitability. The idea that things in the South could ever change, or that they even should change, was an idea that found very few voices. One of those voices was that of Lillian Smith, whose writings during that period expressed impatience with those who thought of themselves as, thought of themselves as progressive, and caused them to envision a very different South, a South which truly embraced the worth of all of its citizens. So following her death, the Southern Regional Council established an annual award in her name to recognize authors who were, whose work carries on the tradition of Lydian Smith, work of outstanding moral vision and literary merit, and which honestly portrays the South, its people, its problems, and its promise. And for the last several years, this award has been presented as a partnership between the Southern Regional Council, which established the award, the University of Georgia Libraries, which housed the Lillian Smith Papers, and the Georgia Center of the Book, which sponsors the Decatur Book Festival. There are many people who work to bring this event to you every year, but I want to take this opportunity to give special recognition to our jurors who worked their way through the 39 books that were nominated this year. Our jury was chaired by Mary Twining Baird. If you will join me in acknowledging her. <laughs> Dr. Baird is from De 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 Decatur, Georgia. I'm, you hail from Decatur, Atlanta? Where do you I'm hail? a Yankee. You're a Yankee. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, where do you resi currently reside? Here in Decatur. Here in Decatur. <laughs> I'm trying to give an illustration of our geographical diversity. <laughs> Okay. About 500 yards from here. Right. Uh, James Taylor from Atlanta, Georgia. <laughs> Meryl Pinson from Atlanta. Are you from Atlanta, Meryl? <laughs> Athens. Athens, Georgia. Diversity. Diversity. <laughs> and Marceline Johnson, all the way from Hilton Head, South Carolina. <laughs> we appreciate. Connie Curry. I'm sorry. As a multiple Lillian Smith Award winner, she, she goes without introduction. She needs no introduction. Uh, at this time, I, at this time, I would ordinarily be my uh, my uh, duty to turn the program over to uh, Dr. Toby Graham, who could not be with us this year because he had a death in his family. So he asked me to present some remarks, but before I do, I wanted to acknowledge uh, that from the beginning of this partnership with the University of Georgia Libraries, Toby has been an integral, an integral piece of that partnership. And this is a special occasion, a special time, because Toby is about to become the librarian for the University of Georgia and vice provost. So we please jo join me in his absence in acknowledging <laughs> The University of Georgia Libraries and its Hargrit Rare Book and Manuscript Library in particular are proud to be a part of the Lillian Smith Book Awards. This 46 year long tradition led by the Southern Regional Council of lifting up important books in the area of so social justice and the changing South. I'd like to thank Margaret Hale, who's back in the back. Let's acknowledge Margaret Hale. I'd like to thank Margaret Hale at UGA for her work on the arrangements for today's proceedings, as well as Vivian Laverne, who staffs the other aspects of the award process. We're also glad to have Craig Amerson with us from Piedmont College, who recently assumed oversight of the Lillian Smith Center near Clayton, Georgia. Craig, will you stand and be recognized? It is my privilege to introduce to you today MJ Mike O'Brien author of We Shall Not Be Moved, 
the Jackson Woolworth sit-in, and the Mississippi move and the movement it expired, published by the University Press of Mississippi. Mike's book centers on a single image, an iconic photograph taken on May 28, 1963, by Fred Blackwell, depicting a biracial group of students being taunted and harassed as they sit peacefully and stoically at a segregated lunch counter. MJ O'Brien sets the stage for us, writing that all of the players are in place. Freddie Blackwell is standing, straddling the lunch counter and the service counter, determined to get the perfect photograph to show us his Jackson News audience exactly what they are missing. He points his camera, clicks his flash, checks his flash, flames the action, and shoots. What we see in the result is a barrage of stories, individual stories, group stories, woven together to make a unique tapestry about race and resolve in a southern town. Mike has done a remarkable job in capturing and conveying that barrage of stories and helping us to better understand the people who were involved in the Jackson, Mississippi movement. He has gone even farther. In reviewing his book, Lillian Smith Book Award author Francoise Hamlin writes that by contrasting the ugliness and human weaknesses on both sides with the bravery and fortitude of a few, O'Brien has crafted a beautifully written text that transcends the local story. Chris Myers Ash writes that scholars and lay readers alike will find much to learn and enjoy in this book. O'Brien's labor of love has produced a fascinating account of this important civil rights history. Congratulations, Mike, on this, your first book and labor of love, which we understand was 20 years in the making. It is my privilege to present you this 2014 William Smith Book Award. Thank you, Charles, for those uh, kind remarks, and uh, it's uh, wonderful to, uh, to be here. Um, when the University Press of Mississippi's publicist uh, told me in an email that, I, that We Shall Not Be Moved had been selected for this award, I immediately wrote back and said, I'm honored, humbled, and speechless for once. <laughs> and that pretty much still sums it up. To think that this book, so long in the making, as Charles said, 20 years, so heartfelt in its intent uh, to tell the complete story of the Jackson Woolworth sit-in of 1963, and all of the singular, that this singular protest unleashed on uh, the state of Mississippi for both good and for ill, uh, to think that this incredible story and my telling of it would come to the attention of the L Lillian Smith jury and that they would deem it worthy to carry this stamp of approval that the award confers. It's just something that I could never have imagined during the many difficult years of yearning for this manuscript to get into the hands of someone who would understand its power and its potential. So I want to thank everyone associated uh, with uh, the award, and most especially um, Lillian Smith herself. As you heard, um, you know, Ms. Smith, uh, we are indebted to her uh, for her courageous efforts to create a better society for her beloved Southland. And her writings of the 30s, 40s, and 50s provided really the intellectual framework um, for white Southerners of conscience to begin to challenge the evils of segregation. So we are really all in her debt. And I was so lucky 37 years ago uh, this summer to come upon my own version of Lillian Smith uh, in the person of Joan Trumpower Mulholland, uh, a slight white southern woman who has Georgia roots. Her mother was from Oconee, Georgia, um, but she had been on the front lines of the student civil rights movement from its very beginning um, in, in the sit-ins in Greensboro. Uh, moved those same demonstrations then to her home 
region of Northern Virginia and Washington, D.C., participated in the Freedom Rides a year later, was locked up in Parchman Penitentiary in Mississippi, ended up integrating the historically black college of Tougaloo College in, right outside of Jackson, and somehow two years later ended up at the center of this demonstration. Uh, that, that uh, Charles described, and which is, in fact, the focal point of We Shall Not Be Moved. When I met Joan in 1977, her radical student movement days were far behind her, and she was a beleaguered uh, single mother of five boys, ranging in ages from nine to five. Now, you do the math. <laughs> the last two were twins. Um, but you would never have suspected that 15 years earlier uh, that she was at the forefront of the revolution for uh, racial equality in this country. And honestly, she never spoke about her activist days. It was all that she could do to get the kids off to school or off to summer camp, which is where I met them and, and eventually met her, uh, and have a few hours of peace before they came rumbling back into her life. Um, so it was really left to the kids to tell me about her radical past. And they would say to me, my mom's in a famous picture. And sometimes they would pull out the scrapbooks and actually prove it to me. And uh, that's how I came to understand uh, Joan's role in the Woolworth sit-in. But I really didn't understand the impact of that pic picture um, until 15 years later, 1992. I'm actually here in Georgia on a business trip, um, staying right at the Marriott Hotel downtown Atlanta. And I decided to make my way over to the Martin Luther King Center, uh, you know, of nonviolent social change right down Auburn Avenue. And after going through the many major exhibits in, in that esteemed location, uh, most of which focus on uh, King's uh, triumphal achievements, uh, I was about to leave and go back to the hotel, go back to work, and I saw a little sign that said photographs. And it was pointing to a little room off to the side. And I said, well, I want to catch everything here before I go back, so I said, I'm just going to make a quick little sweep around the room. And that quick little sweep ended up turning into 20 years. <laughs> because what I saw in that room was that picture that the kids had been telling me about, that little picture that their mom was in, was there uh, amongst all the many other you know, iconic moments of the civil rights movement. And for that photograph to be in that most holy of places for the civil rights uh, shrines, it just shocked me. I actually out loud said, oh my god, I know that woman. Yeah, in the center of the photograph. And uh, I realized this is an important picture. It's not just you know, a scrapbook memento. Um, and so I began to wonder how this photograph really fit in to the overarching you know, timeline of the civil rights movement. And I figured if I didn't know that story and I knew the woman at the center of the photo, most people probably didn't know it either. So this is a story that needs to be told. So from that moment, I determined it was my role to try to tell that as best I could. Not only uh, so that I could figure out what that moment meant for the city of Jackson, for the state of Mississippi, and for the civil rights movement as a whole. So that's what I did with We Shall Not Be Moved. I tried to tell the complete holistic picture of that day um, and, and in retrospect, the entire story of the Jackson movement that it, in fact, did inspire, while using Fred Blackwell's iconic image as a, center, a centerpiece. I started interviewing every single person who was part of that demonstration, and there were nine of them who sat in that day, and anyone else I could find who had a part in, uh, in, try, in making the demonstration a reality. Um, I then branched out to talk to any cameramen or news photographers who might have still been around. Um, I actually talked to one of the undercover cops who was in the, in the Woolworths that day. And he ended up later becoming uh, the chief of police of the city of Jackson. But he was still around. I uh, wrote away uh, under the Freedom of Information Act and got uh, a copy of all the FBI records, because there were many FBI people there in the room that day. They weren't taking any action. You can tell them all because they have their sunglasses on, right? They're, they're trying to be incognito. And, uh, and they're watching everything that's going on, but they're not doing anything to stop the assault that's happening against the, the, the demonstrators. And I even, by scouring through the local high school yearbooks, was able to find one of the guys who was you know, 
in the crowd who was uh, doing all the evil things to the demonstrators. And I, I try to tell his story too. So it was a fascinating project, uh, made even more so by the attempt uh, uh, to find out what really drove those demonstrators to that point in their lives that they were willing to put their lives on the line. And that's exactly what they did. They risked their lives uh, for the cause of racial equality. And, and conversely, I wanted to find out what made those young rebels feel that this demonstration was such a threat to their way of life that they, had to, they, had to, they felt that they had to do whatever they could to try to stop it. Um, and although I have a point of view about all that, uh, I try to give each of those characters uh, the opportunity to speak in their own words and, and to have their, uh, have their say, to have their do. Um, so it was not well known at the uh, time that I started this project 20 years ago, and I honestly don't think it's that well known now that this demonstration set off a two-week groundswell of protests throughout the city of Jackson that, uh, that culminated tragically uh, with the assassination of Medgar Evers, uh, the end of LACP state coordinator and leader of the Jackson movement. And We Shall Not Be Moved documents that entire period up to in and including the Evers funeral uh, where a last-ditch effort was made to revive a faltering movement and, and where Mississippi showed the world what a police state it had become. And, uh, you know, today we've seen echoes of that same type of police crackdown over racial matters just in the past few weeks. Uh, and it's horrifying to me to realize that we have, uh, we keep unlearning the lessons of our own history. Uh, and we just, we can't continue this way. We've got to We've got to change. Well, the book ends by uh, filling out the life stories of all the players on both sides that I was able to contact. Uh, and it tells their stories after the spotlight of history uh, had moved on. And uh, their stories are both uplifting, uh, but also sad, inspiring, but, but also somewhat uh, tinged with tragedy, just as, in fact, the Jackson movement was. And, you know, to my point of view, life tends to be as well. Um, the story that I tend to, that I ended the book with is the story of the photographer. Um, I mentioned him earlier. Fred Blackwell was a 22-year-old rookie photographer at the Jackson Daily News when he took his most famous picture. Um, and on the morning of May 28, 1963, he was told to go to Woolworths and cover what was expected to be a very pro forma demonstration. Instant arrest was expected. And so he thought he'd only have a few seconds to take a few shots so that he could get them into the afternoon paper. But when the police refused to enter the store and allowed a mob uh, to develop, Blackwell found himself as one of the few still photographers amongst a gathering uh, throng of hostile teenagers and uh, local adult whites. And what's interesting about this story is that Blackwell himself was a local. He had grown up just down the street from some of the kids who were dumping the ketchup and the mustard and hurling the insults at the demonstrators. He had gone to the same school with their older brothers and sisters. He was one of them. And like them, he entered Woolworths that morning as a segregationist. But what he witnessed that day would change his life because he watched the members of his own class and culture turn into the hateful pawns of the unjust system of segregation with their taunts and assaults on peaceful and nonviolent citizens. And he began to question the very underpinnings of the society that had nurtured him. And he left that scene profoundly shaken. He, uh, as a result of what he witnessed that day, Blackwell began to realize that segregation was unsustainable. Uh, he had seen its evil underbelly and he had endured the three hours of uh, assaults along with the demonstrators and the chaos and the cruelty of the crowd. So he became a believer of racial integration. Something shifted in his heart that day, and he has never wavered. So for me, Fred Blackwell became a symbol of hope for the New South, which, uh, as we know, continues to evolve with a script that continues to be written. I want to quickly thank the Southern Regional Council, that formidable organization that has uh, supported progressive social change now for nearly a century. 
along with the University of Georgia Libraries and the Georgia Center for the Book for sponsoring this award. I want to thank our esteemed panel of, of uh, judges uh, for their recognition of We Shall Not Be Moved as a story that would, I hope, even make Miss Lillian proud. Um, I also want to thank the University Press of Mississippi for taking a chance on this untried uh, emerging author. This is the first time that one of their books has ever um, been awarded this prize. And it tells you something, I think, about uh, that, how far that state is coming in, in acknowledging its past and seeking a degree of racial reconciliation. I must thank my wife, Allison McGill, who's here today uh, with me, uh, who has been with me throughout this entire 20-year uh, odyssey and who's been a constant source of encouragement. I have a couple of other people also to thank who have local ties to Georgia. Uh, Lynn Whitaker was my first editor. Lynn is here also, and the first person to make me believe, come on, you can, you can say hi, ladies. <laughs> uh, to make me believe that writing this story and getting it published was within the realm of possibility. And Lynn is, uh, as I said, a native of Georgia. She's now a graduate student at the University of Georgia, um, getting her PhD in English literature. And, um, Another person with local ties to my head, oh, a great debt of gratitude to is, is Julian Bond. And Julian wrote the foreword, beautiful foreword for the book, uh, and was an early champion of my work. So it's great to be able to accept this award in what used to be his home turf. Um, I'd like to dedicate this award, as I dedicated the book, to Joan Trumpower Mulholland, to Medgar Evers and his family, and, and to all those who participated in the Jackson movement. It was their witness their courage, their sacrifice that helped change our world. And in closing, let me just quickly return to uh, Fred Blackwell and that incredibly evocative photograph. Uh, Fred never received the kind of recognition that I believe he deserved while working on what was called the race beat. He never won a Pulitzer Prize or a News Photographer's Award because in those days it was the publisher, not the photographer, who submitted entries uh, for these types of awards. And there was no Southern segregationist newspaper that was going to think that that photograph had any merit whatsoever. <coughs> but no matter, Fred just went ahead and did his job and created, as I say in the book, an image that captured the essence of an era. And because his photograph inspired me to write this story and kept me going even during the darkest days when I didn't think it would ever see the light of day, I'd like to share this award with Fred Blackwell, who's still alive and living in Jackson, and to thank him publicly for his exceptional service to his profession and to our country. Thank you all so very much for this great honor. the change they want to see in this modern world. I have the distinct honor and privilege of getting to introduce Dr. Bernard Lafayette. Uh, his accomplishments are so numerous and so significant that uh, you're going to have to throw me out of the meeting, Charles, because it's going to go on a while. <laughs> Um, uh, would you believe we are awarding the Lillian Smith Prize to a street gang leader <laughs> and ex-con? He went to Parchman. And there are a lot of people who uh, didn't have the courage to survive Parchman. And has an award from the Highlander Folk School. This is an extremely short list. This is a man of many parts who fears not to tread where others quailed at the 
obduracy of the foe and the entrenchment of the mores and laws, firm in the faith that nonviolence had to prevail, his strength was as the strength of ten because his heart and his intention were pure. We need no further demonstration of man's inhumanity to man than what we are seeing lately at home and abroad. It behooves us to remember and celebrate those brave workers who waded through the strife and faced down the forces of racism and terror. Bernard Lafayette, Jr., one such courageous man, was a co-founder of SNCC, leader in the Nashville lunch counter sit-ins, a freedom rider on the segregated buses and terminals, an associate of Martin Luther King's and Southern Christian Leadership <coughs> Conference and National Coordinator of the Poor People's Campaign, <gasps> Director of the Alabama Voter Registration <laughs> Campaign in Selma, Alabama. At any point during these organizational activities, he could have lost his life. In these parlous times when civil unrest caused by unforgivable prejudice we remember the words of the old song, glory be to God, we're gonna need him again. Presently, he is a distinguished scholar of, in residence at the uh, Candler Theological Seminary at Emory University and the chairman of the board of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. We have but a small token of our esteem to award Bernard Lafayette, Jr., but I know none of us on the committee will ever forget this courageous man. And do I get to present them? Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> Dr. Lafayette. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Johnson and Mr. Bart, and my fellow awardee, Mr. Bryant. Just, uh, just absolutely um, overwhelmed, that would be my word, with um, this kind of distinction. And I've received many awards over the last 50 years, and I've uh, been given a lot of things, including time in jail. <laughs> they give you that, you know, you don't have to pay for it. <laughs> you don't have to fill out an application, you know. <laughs> they give you room and board. <laughs> yes, and uh, we used to have, uh, you'd notice, if you check the record very closely, we always had our sit-ins before lunch. <laughs> at the lunch counters, because we weren't going to be served lunch. But if we could get arrested before lunch, we'd get food in jail. <laughs> yes, so we always had uh, sit-ins, you know, at a time when we could uh, make sure. But I wanted to, first of all, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Johnson, and the committee members, uh, judges, who uh, decided that uh, my book should get this award. I really do appreciate, you know, this distinction that you've given uh, this book. And uh, when I look at these two uh, ladies right here, there's a history there. I used to pastor a church. Her uh, father used to pastor and, and um, you know, uh, some people don't know that uh, Ms. Connie Curry was our, and Mr. Ella Baker were our advisors to SNCC. <coughs> and have were two, and both were women. One white, one black. That's all we needed. <laughs> no, they, they had an unusual thing, and I learned that from them. How you give guidance rather than Direction. There's a difference. Mm -hmm. Directing people and then guiding them. Mm -hmm. 
And that's what I learned from those two women who helped SNCC from its infancy to become an organization that made a lot of contribution uh, to the movement. And I cannot uh, forget that John Lewis uh, used to also be director of the voter registration, voter education project. But it was uh, Randolph Blackwell who made a long speech before his, his departure to a group. And I never will forget. Some people said, well, he's talking too long. I said, what do you mean too long? How much is too long when this ended up being his last major speech? Did you know that? Yeah. That's right. And um, so, but I'm not going to talk long. <laughs> Come on. But this is not going to be my last speech. <laughs> uh, it's just such a pleasure and a privilege to uh, have uh, Senator Charles Steele, Jr., and his wife. And that to join me as my special guest. He's the president of the National Southern Christian Leadership Conference, who insists that the organization will continue to survive, thrive, and make its contribution to humanity. And he's going to Germany just uh, in a few weeks from now to make the same speech that Martin Luther King made in Berlin, what, 50 years ago? Yeah, isn't that something? And they are just so excited over in Berlin in terms of Martin Luther King's contribution and what he did to uh, make a difference there. And we're mainly going to learn more about the work of Martin Luther King in Germany, which we didn't know. So time will tell if you allow time to open its mouth. <laughs> So, and my wife, who is the uh, love of my life, and <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> Kate Lafayette. Yeah, her father was Booker T. Washington's office boy. Yeah. No, in Tuskegee. Built the first black supermarket, like Angus. The first federal housing in Tuskegee. Her father started that. You know how he was able to get that through? He knew how to keep his mouth shut. <laughs> That's how he was able to get it. OK? There's a time to open your mouth, and there's a time to keep it closed. And he knew when, OK? Did that. So, oh, you heard of Propeller Club, right? Those who know about the uh, Tuskegee Airmen? Her father was the one that built the, uh, uh, the club, Propeller Club. He was a serious businessman. And I'm glad I got a chance to know him before he uh, departed. Wonderful. But I'm not worried about going to heaven. <clears throat> Uh, the Lord uh, wanted to make sure I get there, so he sent me an angel, my wife. To show me. I'll be there. Okay. I'm coming. <laughs> but I appreciate the time that I have here to continue to make whatever contribution. The book is uh, one section of my autobiography. I couldn't do the whole thing at one time because uh, it had just been too long because I'm still doing work and the longer I wait, you know, the more the book would have uh, just been too heavy to carry around. <laughs> so I decided to get a little snippet, okay? A little portion of it. Some of the things that will be helpful, okay? So I hope we have the time for at least a couple of questions, that kind of thing, so I'm gonna be short. You got one question. <laughs> you can ask that question on your mind, just one, okay? <laughs> okay. Um, what I'm interested in 
in terms of the book is three things. One is the book is dedicated to all uh, the, the, uh, women, okay? Like my grandmother, my mother, my wife, and Mrs. Boynton. By the way, uh, she had a birthday uh, last week, 110. <laughs> yeah, Amelia Boynton Robinson. And she would sit up in the bed talking to us and, and reminding us of all the things. That go. You're supposed to, as a minister, you're supposed to visit the sick, but you're not supposed to stay a long time. <laughs> That's why they're in the hospital, to get them away from folks who talk them to death, okay? And so you've been trained. I went to the American Baptist uh, Seminary. You stay 15 minutes, but I couldn't stop her from talking. <laughs> she kept going. <laughs> Yeah, she's full of it. She understands so many things and so much a part of history. The book, when I couldn't remember certain things, I would call her, a woman who was 108 years old, uh -oh. and she would give me all the details and things that I needed to know. So she's not just here, she's, uh, you know, making a contribution still. Isn't that something? Let's give an applaud for Mrs. Bunny. She was a woman that you saw on photos that was knocked down on that bridge when they had the bridge crossing from Selma to Montgomery. You had a big, tall, regal woman who was there on the sidewalk, knocked down. They tear gassed her and hit her in the head and everything. And the horse uh, ran over her. Yeah, she was the one that made the decision to stay in Selma, Alabama with her husband, Mr. Boynton, and they found it, along with others, the voter register, the Dallas County Voters League. I have to quickly say this, because this is a mistake that we made in the movement, and I'm old enough now to share errors that we've made, so you won't repeat them as young people, okay? And had we done what we should have done Okay, and of course the Southern uh, Regional Council laid the groundwork and all we had to do was follow it and we didn't do it. And that was to establish citizenship education programs in every county. We had the protection for the right to vote. That's what the bill was about. But what we didn't do was to institutionalize a way to help people. How do you expect people to know how to vote and how to participate in government when they've been locked out for how many years? They know how to get their gun registered, but in their car, in their horse, okay? But they didn't know how to go and get themselves registered. Now, my confession is I never took anybody down to register to vote except those in Wilcox County who hadn't gone down in 50 years, how the G's been. Because I say what you've got to do is learn how to go register to vote. We will teach you how to fill out the forms and the application, but you need to take your <coughs> self down to register to vote, because I'm not going to be here when it's time for you to go vote. Right. I can't go around and take everybody around to vote. So our error we made was not to establish a citizenship education program in every county. It's not too late to do that. And that is the problem that we're having today. That's right. That's because of what we didn't do. You think we'd have Ferguson if those people were registered to vote and know how to participate in government? That's right. We have the solution, we just haven't implemented it. The problem is complicated, the solution is simple. How many folks in our family are not registered to vote? I told my granddaughter, I ain't got no money for me unless you show me a voter registration card. <laughs> yeah, that's your ticket. <laughs> yeah. So what we got, to, these young people, they're turning 18 every day. Did you know that? <laughs> and no one has told them how to go register to vote. What we need to do is have a birthday party every month for those turn 18, and your registration card uh, will be your admittance. We need to do that. We need to help these young people learn how to participate. They took it out of the schools. 
Why do you think they did that? Hmm? That's my point. So we, the burden is on us. We can march and we can demonstrate, and of course I believe in that. I've been arrested 27 times. But unless we do the groundwork and the education is necessary, we're not going to see the kind of change that we want to see and the change that needs to take place. I'd like to start registering those at 12 years old to have a youth government. I told you had a youth legislature in Georgia. You have to take a, go to class to learn how to drive a car to get your license, driver's ed. What about citizen's ed? You're going to drive the government. You need to have what? A license and you need some training to make it happen. So that's what this book is about, one thing. The next is that you have to learn how to develop leadership in your church, in your community, in your club, your organization. To just come once a year and have the great annual meeting is not enough. It's what you do in the meantime, okay? Yes, the celebration is the work that you have been doing all along. That's what you're celebrating about. And this is what we've got to learn to do. Um, Mr. Steele, for example, has a program, Justice for Girls, which is focused on <coughs> selling young women and exploiting them. We're talking about slaves. Slavery is not over. Folks are still selling folk. One thing to sell out, another is to sell in. So the selling is going on. And that's one of the programs that the SCLC, okay, is working on, on a daily basis. Finally, the book is about appreciating those people who made enormous contributions to the movement. I close by saying that I was a target for assassination when Medgar Evers was killed in Jackson, Mississippi, and I knew him very well. In fact, I was with him when the Freedom Rides was in Jackson, and he helped to get us an office there on Lynch Street in order to be able to uh, do our training because we trained folks from Jackson to be involved. But Megan Evers was a close friend and really admired him and I learned a lot from him. He was executive uh, secretary of the state of Mississippi for the NAACP. And I was a member since uh, 12 years old, NAACP card. I have my life membership in my pocket right now. Yeah, because it was the life of the movement when I was growing up. Yeah, NAACP. On that same night that he was assassinated, I was encountered by two white men who had faked a, a disabled car. And they asked me if I would give them a push. And uh, I volunteered to give a push. It was 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night. And I thought that uh, you know I was trying to get some rest because we don't sleep in the movement. So if we can just pretend that we get in bed, that'd be good. So I was just trying to, you know, get to bed. I knew I wasn't going to sleep because you don't know when a bomb is going to come flying through your window. So every little noise, a cricket sound, you, you know, wide awake. So as I attempted to give them a push, the one on the outside was looking at the bumpers of the car. And the car I had was a 48 Chevrolet back in 1963. You know, you know where I got that car from? Julian Bond. <laughs> that was one of his jobs, distributing cars to the snake workers. And they had new cars and everything, and he gave me a 48 Chevrolet. I said, I said, Julian, I mean, what's wrong with you? He said, listen, man, listen, Bernard. He said, uh, for going in these rural areas where you are going, this is the best car you can get. It has a huge tires on it, and it's made out of some real metal, okay, not plastic, and it, it can, you can bank the round curves. 
you know, those uh, wooden, I mean, those uh, uh, dirt roads and everything, that would be the uh, car you need. And so, um, you know, and it, it has high, you know, windows. So you can scoot down in the car <laughs> and drive. And I wasn't that tall, you know. Yeah. And uh, so it had high bumper guards on it. So as I was push, giving this guy a push, uh, he, uh, he looked at me and I said, uh, he said, kept hesitating and bumping around. And he was a huge guy too. He was a white fella and his, 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 he didn't have a neck. His head just sat <laughs> right down in his shoulders, you know? And so when he turned around, he had to turn everything, you know? And uh, he had a t-shirt on and the muscles were so big, you know, the, the shirt rolled up. So what he said was, you better get out and take a look. Because he asked me how much, he had, uh, uh, how much I would charge him, and I said, nothing. So I got out, and I was in a hurry. I bent down, and then he, boom, he hit me in the head. We're straight down to the ground, but I jumped up. That's what you got to do when you get knocked down. Nonviolence teaches you how to get up, OK? You got to get up. If there's anything left in you, get up. And I stood right in front of him and looked at him. So he hit me again. And the, the scar is still there. And I went down. And then he hit me again. See, by this time, you learn to roll with the punch. So you absorb the energy of your opponent as part of nonviolence. It's not that you don't do anything. Yes, you do. You're working. Even under attack, you're working. OK? Yeah. To transform the energy of your opponent to your own strength. And that's the thing that got me to get up, the strength of my opponent. And then the third time I looked at him, and he came down on top of my head again. And I went flat down, and then I got right back up and looked at him. I had to look up, because he was a big fella. And you know what happened? He got scared. You know, knocked the guy three times, a little skinny you know, guy like me. I didn't even wear short pants in those days. And, uh, <laughs> And he's standing there looking at you after you done knocked him out twice, okay? Then I realized he had a gun, and he's gonna shoot me. So I turned around and I said, Red! Upstairs over where I lived, there was a fellow named Red who'd come from Vietnam, and he called himself my bodyguard. I didn't ask him, but he volunteered, you know. <laughs> and he came across the banister with the gun, and, uh, and, he, and I stepped between him and the fellow who was hitting me, and said, no, Red, don't shoot. Don't shoot him, Red. Don't shoot. And he was trying to jockey around to get a position. Don't shoot, Red. Don't shoot. By that time, the guy jumped in the car and took off. There was nothing wrong with that car. They were going to try to lure me down into that neighborhood where they had a group waiting on me so they can do an Emmett Till on me. Yeah. Megger wasn't that fortunate. They shot him the same night. The FBI came to investigate. When the FBI came to investigate, they told me that there was a three-state conspiracy that had been planned in New Orleans. It's supposed to have killed Ben Elton Cox. Ben Elton Cox was a Freedom Rider. And you will see him on the Freedom Riders film. He came out of court on the original ride. And they're supposed to get Medgar Evers in Jackson, Mississippi. They're supposed to get Ben Elton Cox in Louisiana. Medgar Evers in Mississippi. They're supposed to have gotten me in some. But they missed. But even if they had killed me, they would have missed because I had already given my life. And when you've given your life, nobody can take it. Do we have a word on the on the books? Did you were you able to get a summary? I'm sorry, so that, so that uh, outside, the office will be able to sign the book plates and you can order the books. 
outside if you don't have them. We value these works of history not just for the sake of history itself, but for the lessons that history provides for the world in which we live today. For all those who thought we had overcome, the recent events of Sanford and Staten Island and Ferguson should serve as a wake-up call. So when Reverend Sharpton called on the people of Ferguson not to have a fit, but instead to create a movement, there are probably some of those in this day and age who may have wondered what he was talking about. Fortunately, there are places that they can turn to learn what a movement is, what it takes to make a movement successful, and to learn about those things that can stand in the way of success. If the black community of Ferguson is disrespected, even though it compromises a majority of the city's population, it might have something to do with the underrepresentation that that community has created by not taking advantage of the voting rights that were secured on the streets of Selma. The authors that we honor today have provided a valuable service, not just by telling great stories and telling them well, but also by providing lessons that are highly relevant to us as we face the challenges of today's ever-changing world. We're once again thankful to the University of Georgia Libraries and the Georgia Center for the Book, and we thank you for coming. Thank you.